pray. Oh, yeah. Lord, we thank you, Jesus, for the opportunity to be here. We know that you're above everything. Please lead us and guide us and direct us on the pathway you have us to go. Please bless our thoughts, dear God. Please be with us. We need your help with, through everything, dear God. We, without you, we have no understanding. Without you, we have no knowledge. We can do nothing. In your mighty name, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> yeah. So, we're going to talk about, um, for the camera's sake, we're going to talk about the seven churches of Asia, which is the beginning of the book of Revelations. Well, just a little after the beginning. Now, I'm going to talk about it partly because I have a burden in my heart for it, not just because I think it's interesting, because I ain't looking at it in the way most people look at it. Um, first of all, my attitude toward Revelation is pretty well leave it alone unless God tells you something about it. Otherwise, your guess is as good as mine. And I don't... Um, I mean, I, I know a lot about Revelations. I've, I've listened to people talk about Revelations. I've done a lot of studying on Revelations. But I don't pretend like I understand something unless God opens my understanding. And I ain't going to do that. And there's people out there who do these big, giant studies about it, talk confidently about Revelations. And you think to yourself, you know, where did they get? Did, well, did God inspire them? Well, what if they did? What if God opened up the mysteries to them? Okay, well, God's going to have to tell me that they opened up the mysteries to them. Otherwise, how do I know? Either I understand it or I don't. Either God's saying, listen to this man, or he does not. So I'm not going to, because I don't want to have a, a false teaching. I don't want to have false revelation. I don't want to have something in my mind that shouldn't be in there. And because everything works together in God's word. Everything that you learn in God's word, wherever it may be, is there for a reason and a purpose. God's not playing around. I mean, it, it's all linked together. It all works together. If you don't fully understand it, don't pretend like you do. You know, because the things just, uh, they, they build on each other. You know, precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little and there a little. They all stack on, on, on each other. So that's how I approach Revelations to begin with. So when I'm talking about this stuff, I have a reason. <laughs> You know, I have a reason for this. My reason is, is that um, um, there was a set of teachings that God was talking to me about. And um, I had asked him questions concerning people. I had asked him questions concerning the word of God and certain things I didn't understand. Um, I'm always trying to figure out people, you know, trying to figure out how to talk to them. And I've always had a lot of friction with people for no good reason. I didn't know what was what was getting between me and them. So I asked God to understand people, to understand what, what's going on here. And when you ask God in sincerity, and you don't back off from it, you don't waver from it, well, God begins to teach you. Now, it may take a long time, right? It may be something that you may ask uh, a huge, large subject, and it may take a while, but he's going to teach you. And so over the last 15 years or so he's sort of broken down little pieces here and there about people now it got to a point where i would call it dare to call it a a uh, personality theory where you begin to understand people's personalities and groups and such and things like that and i always question it it's like well am i getting into the flesh here right am i getting into some wild understanding am i starting to do but every time i turn around god will confirm it in some way well one of the things he used to confirm it is the seven churches of Asia. So I'm going to talk about them because there's something special about this. Okay, so I'm going to get a couple ideas out of the way because I've heard theories, I've heard people talk about these things before. Now, some people believe that those seven churches have to do with the seven church ages and that that throughout the ages, like every, like a, um, every I don't know, perhaps the, the, the time... The measure of time is variable, right? I don't know if it's like every 500 years. No, it's more like, but it, it's a space of time. Like, well, during this time, uh, this happened, and then this, this church age come along, then this church age, and we're in the final church age. And I've heard people try to really explain it, but again, you can give your theory, and you can say, well, it looks like this, but unless I have something anchor it, I don't know it. 
it's, I might find it interesting, and I'll wait on the Lord to anchor it for me because God knows, right? He knows, and he knows how to talk to me. But, you know, I listen. I listen to these people. Then I've heard people talk about that it's, um, <clears throat> well, I'll see. Church ages is one. Another one is that it's real basic, that it's liter- literally writing to the seven churches that are in the area of the time, and that's the only people that are being written to. But if you... So if it, it isn't for us. It was just for the church. That's what they think. Okay. okay. These are the, Their the theories. theories that are out there. That I've heard, you know, and I know there's probably dozens of more, like just wild amount of theories on that stuff. And they'll say, well, this church was in this area and they had these problems and that church was in that area. They had these problems. But if you read it, you know that it seems like every thing that's said about these churches can apply to you in some way because it's not, it's not so distant that it, you can't relate in some way to it. You kind of got an idea of, the, of what it's trying to say, especially when it talks about being lukewarm. <laughs> God, I would rather you hot or cold, but not lukewarm. Well, that's preaching a message, right? And people use it in their sermons and such. So there's, there's teaching within those things. Now, this is what I understand it to be. Now, this is based on God doing this to me, nailing it down. That these are dealing with seven um, um, personality groups. And I'm using my words. Um, but they are the, the seven churches. But they're not talking about spread out throughout the ages. It's all at the same time. They're, they've always existed. They're existing today. Seven types of members of the Yeah, church. seven types of churches and it's uh based on the like personality the kind of people that they are and um there's these basic like i said these basic personality types that exist and now there are uh there's scientific stuff out there that where they've discovered a bunch of these themselves but they would leave out this or that because they you know whatever and then there's like because like for instance there's a there's a thing called bartles Bartles principle, or and it's uh, or Bartles taxonomy, and it was established for video games because they were trying to figure out what kind of people enjoyed certain types of video games, and they were doing this research so they could make money. So they would design video games so to appeal to certain people, and they would balance these games and see they would un- unknowingly. Uh, sort of mess uh be playing around with personality types because oh yeah this kind of person does this and he likes this and he prefers these things and this is what we should add to this game and but if we you know we do this other thing then it's gonna it's not going to work and we're not going to sell our games and so you have these uh studies that are out there right and god would let me look at those things but he had something bigger in mind in in my case and i I asked this is what happens when you ask god it doesn't matter what question it is. It doesn't matter how big it is. God will work with you if you ask him in faith and you mean it, right? I'm not, I didn't learn this stuff so I could um, cram it into other people's ears and tell everybody how smart I am. No, I was needing it because I, I had an, a need of understanding people because I was such, I, I felt like I was lacking so much and I couldn't figure out who I was talking to and I, I I didn't understand why people were rough or mean to me, you know, and things like that. There was something I was missing, and I knew I was missing. And so I asked with genuine faith. So that's sort of my introduction there. So this, this, uh, I start off with uh, the idea that that these are for, for people, certain types of people. Each one is for a different type of person. Therefore, if it's that, which I believe it's that, and I'm just going to say it in that way, then you can surmise that what's said, right, is important currently. It's currently important to these people. Now, since it's written to different types of people, they're like little messages written. So he gives a warning, and he gives encouragement, and he, he, that's what he does in these little bitty snippets. I even uh, color-coded. I went through it and color-coded to, uh, to match them up. Like he would start off with an intro. It's the same type of intro. Right? It's a generic sort of intro, but it would be customized to that person. 
different people understand things in different ways. Yeah, so he would say it in a different way for those groups. And he knew he knows what encourages them. He knows what discourages them. He knows where the weaknesses are. He knows how to, to relay his thought, and he knows how to do it briefly. And that's what he's doing. But he, uh, I, I wrote these things out, and you can see these little intros in each one and exits. Like, for instance, all of them, he did include this. He says, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. After each one, he, he does that. You know, there's, there's commonalities, uh, very close commonalities in all of them. So we're going to start with the first one, which is Revelation, it's the second chapter. So in, on one part of this, it may sound like, well, this is really deep, advanced stuff. But to be honest, to me, it's a message that needs to be heard because people are missing out on what it's trying to do. Everybody has a little bit of a mix of all the personalities. Yeah, we're all we all a, a, you have a main one that drives you. Mostly. Yeah. See, we all have a little aspects of every one of these, but some it's the dominant part of us. So, second chapter of Revelations, it says, first verse, unto the angel of the church of Ephesus, write, these things saith. He that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Now I believe that's still referring to the same one, the spirits, the seven, seven churches or the seven spirits and the seven eyes. The candlesticks. Yeah, it's all the, it's all the same thing. It's, that's where the seven comes from. Jesus is the yeah. one who walks in the midst, right? Yeah, he's the one in the midst of the, the candles. Seven. It says, I know thy works. He's emphasizing these. I know thy works and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say that they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne, and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored, and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of this place except thou repent. But this thou hast, is encouraging, but this thou hast that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans which I also hate. So we both hate the same thing here. <laughs> and by the way, the Nicolaitans, whatever, I'm not, going, I'm not going to pronounce that correctly. No, no telling what the original sounded like anyway. But they had a, a doctrine that was the same, or close to Baal and Balaam and all this stuff. Uh, the, the, you know, so it's all, uh, it, three things are mentioned here. You got the Nicolaitans or Nicolaitans, whatever. Then you have... Um, uh, Jezebel, you have Balaam, Balak, and different ones that are that are mentioned throughout this th this text, and it's all basically the same thing, a little bit just minor differences. Now, some of this stuff, it, you know, it's going to take God revealing exactly, you know, the nuance why He used that, but He does describe things around it, so He he'll, He He kind of makes it clear, and He kind of it's still difficult. Um, anyway, so. The Nicolaitans, which also I hate. Then he says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh, will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of paradise, of the paradise of God. Now this right here, I try to read it a little bit fast and there. But what I understand it to be is you're dealing with a I call it. I'm, I'm sure there's a prettier name. You have per certain <laughs> names that helps you understand yeah, the basic it's drive. The concept, it's because it's a concept, it's not about names. Yeah. Now, it's something called a, a, and I've met a few of these, I would call them a hate-based personality. A hate-based. Now, that doesn't mean that they're running around hating people. They hate things that are wrong, and they focus on that. It's kind of like you find people that are very social, you find people that are uh, honor, you know, they deal with honor and honor, you know, that's what's on their mind. Well, you got people that 
are disgusted with anything that's wrong and they talk about it and they think about it. And if you do something that they don't like, they're gonna let you know about it. That don't mean that they're evil. That just means they have no toleration for stupidity or anything else that comes up, comes up in front of them. Doesn't mean everything they do is right either. Right, and it, we're, you know, they're all, they're just people, right? And so it says, I know thy works and thy labor. The second verse again, I want, I want to emphasize what this means in the scripture. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience. He's talking about their patience. Now, I've, I've, when you meet these people, this is who they are. This is how they think. And they need patience. And it's kind of like they said, well, you're doing real good, uh, Sister, uh, uh, Sister Nancy. You know, it's like you're doing real good there. And perhaps you're not doing all that great. But you know what? I'm going to encourage you to keep working on it. <laughs> it says, I know... Um, it says, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how that's, thou canst bear them which are evil. You can't even bear them. And thou hast tried them which say that they are apostles and are not and hast found them liars. Because that's what they care. They just can't stand that mess. And hast borne and hast patience and for my name's sake hast labored and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. They get so focused on, on the things that they dislike, they don't, they start to begin, they begin to forget the things that they should love and especially God, their first love. It, it, and it's a distraction for them and it can become too much for them. Everybody has a flaw and everybody has a, a thing that they do better than others and they also have a flaw. Right, they have those, those things going for them. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent and do thy first works or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place except thou repent. So he's basically just telling it like it is. He's being straightforward to this person. But this, but this thou hast, this is one thing we have in common. Thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. <laughs> you know, it says, you hate it. Well, so do I. So that's one thing I like about you, right? You, you, you got to hate evil. You can't yeah. just love good. Yeah, part of love. Love doesn't work without. Yeah, you can't just, I love, you know, everything, right? There's things you have to hate. You have things you have to be away from. You have to despise. You have to despise false doctrine. You have to despise evil things and partaking in those things. You don't want to appear... Uh, you're supposed to avoid the even the very appearance of evil. I mean, your your words and the things you say is supposed to be you know mixed with with salt, and and you're supposed to not lose that savor, right? We're supposed to 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 show, have that joy and to show that joy and to show that goodness, as well as despise all that which is evil. Number two. Um, Starting with the eighth verse. Um, and unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which, which was dead and is alive. I love these intros. Because <laughs> <laughs> he's awesome, right? And you just take these intros out alone and, and you can read those. It's just really a magnificent. Different ways to look at yeah. God, kind of. And unto the angel of the church of Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say that they are Jews and are not, but thou art the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Okay, this personality type, again, I know, I know very, very well. Um, that's the personality of, it's, it's called a life-based personality. It's someone who, who lives after the, the most, yeah, they want to live, 
And that's their primary. See, we all want to live. But how many people have their primary desire is to live? Some people are willing to die for honor or, you know, like sacrifice themselves for others. And they think that's honorable. Yeah. Well, well, um, actually, offhand, I can't remember exactly a certain thing on that, on the life based. Because uh, um, what was that? The most life based people that I've met are usually the ones that um, they harp on it all the time. Like they're they're afraid. Don't do that. They have a lot of fear naturally. They're they're scared of a lot of things. Mm-hmm. You, you see the worry. That's what's on their mind. That's what they're thinking about. And if it wasn't for God, they'd be worried all the time. They have to, you know, God is, is the fixer of all these things, all these problems. And you begin to think about what God can do and how he can take care of you and and uh, rely on him and trust in him. And it takes a lot of these things away. It's called a life-based, is the desire to live. It's, being the, what? it's a, a life-based personality. It's what I give yes, the name. I use it consistently. I think it's kind of silly, some of these things, but this terminology. But anyway... This, this uh, whole thing is built around that concept anyway. It says, unto the, again, the eighth verse, and unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, these things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, for thou art the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you. Now notice he did not talk about their sins or their problems. Um, I would say like a, a problem they have to worry about often is, is um, self-exaltation and boasting because boasting is about um, building your value as a person. You know, it, um, if you are very, very depressed and, and you feel like you're worthless, that's when usually people start thinking about things like suicide and of that nature. And they will offset that by boasting. And um, that's just one of the things that they do, and that gets them into trouble. That right there will. But he didn't mention any of that in this particular deal. He just says, he just skipped over that and says, here, fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer, Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Because this whole thing is focused on that, about that. Now, I've known these people. It's, for some reason, it's always been difficult for me to describe it. Uh, uh, what they what they do because it's real basic. It's a basic thing. So I'm just going to move on to the next one. I'll, I'll I'll figure this out a little bit better later. But this is this stuff is hard to understand on my end. But I can point it out. I understand what it's talking about. The next one it says the twelfth verse. And to the angel of the church of Pergamos write these things saith he that hath the sharp sword with two edges. That, to me that tells me exactly what. Anyway, I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. And thou, and thou holdest fast my name and hast not denied my faith, even in those, th- even in those days where Antipas was my faithful martyr, <coughs> who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. <clears throat> but I have a few things against thee because thou hast them, thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication, which is very similar to the other one, the, the one that dealing with hate because of uh, the Nicolaitan. Oh, well, good. <laughs> so, so hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. So <laughs> there you go. I didn't realize. Okay. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. 
To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth save he that receiveth it. And I love that last scripture about the, that special stone that you receive that no man knoweth save he that receiveth it. It's cool. <laughs> it's cool as I'll get out. Um, now, the, it, it mentions here again the Nicolaitans, uh, Balaam, which uh, behold, thou hast there that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak, Balaam taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel. And specifically to eat things sacrificed in the idols and to commit fornication. Now, a lot of that stuff, you know, basically it's a false doctrine, false, false God, false doctrine, and they taught that. They learned uh, this. They have them the amongst these people. You have this these people who teach. Um, they hold the doctrine of Balaam. They hold that doctrine, and course uh, dealing with um, fornication and idols and such okay so I had to mention that real quick this right here is um, what I know it to be is uh, what I call a knowledge based personality a knowledge base is someone who just loves knowledge and is focused on that only Right, like, like for instance, I give you an example. Of somebody who has no conscience about knowledge. You, you ever heard a, sci a scientist who's uh, willing to, you know, cut people up just to figure out, even if you know, like how your heart's beating. Or mad scientists, they have no ethics. You know, S somebody just will do anything to learn to figure things out. You know, it's of the flesh, right? It's knowledge. So I just want to know. I'm curious. I'm trying to figure it out. It's not like you're trying to say, well, God, I want to be pleasing to you. Teach me how. That's different. <laughs> and you begin to, and, and so knowledge under God, under God and wisdom under God is great because that helps you to walk upright before him. But knowledge for knowledge's sake is not necessarily a good thing because there's people out there just pursues. I mean, you look at all the scientists today who, who believe in evolution, right? They're brilliant minds. There's these people that go and, and learn the deepest things that they can learn. Mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> they, they learn the deepest things you, you need in a nap. <laughs> she took a uh, oh, oh, that'll do it. Oh, yeah, I'm so sorry. You want me to reach over and slap you? <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah, no, no, on. I understand. I understand. I, I, I do the same thing to it's hard to do that with Brother Billy, though. Sometimes. It yeah, is. he might He might come over here. And <laughs> he might. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so that's what this kind of person is, is just somebody who's just after knowledge for knowledge. It says, and I'll read it again quickly. I try to, anyway. And to the angel of the church of Pergamos write, These things saith he that hath the sharp sword with two edges. We know that the sharp sword is the word of God. It's a two-edged sword. Uh -huh. So this is our God. Remember, he's the head of everything here. Uh -huh. You can't, the knowledge that he has is unfathomable. It's, there's no end to it. Sure. Right? And his understanding is deeper and his wisdom is, is no one can match. And that's what this is emphasizing. These things saith that he that hath the sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works and where thou dwellest. It says, I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. And, and thou holdest fast my name and hast not denied my faith, even in the days of Antipas, which was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. So there's a, he's getting real specific about, about this. <clears throat> but I have a few things against thee because, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. So he's getting real specific about things. He's, he's very, he's, he's, that, that's very much what you would want to say to a, somebody who cares about it, about the knowledge portion of it. He's getting real specific. 
Repent, or else I will come to thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Now, this is the one who has this two-edged sword. Mm -hmm. He says, I want to get you. If you keep taking this, keep going this way, right? You should know better. He that hath an ear, because, and I tell you what, I've seen where people, uh, you know, they, again, knowledge for knowledge's sake, they start, sometimes people will start bringing new things because it's different. It's kind of like what the, what happened with Paul, I think it was Paul, where they were uh, met those people from Greece or they were near Greece and the Greeks and they were, this, but all these people stood around waiting for some new thing to be taught, mm-hmm. right? That's all they did. Night, they, some people, they, they didn't have a job, they just, that's what they did. We were waiting around. Um, I guess the state was taking care of them for all I know, I don't know. But um, that's exactly what, what, what goes on. You know, and some new thing will be taught. It says, well, this isn't interesting for, everybody knows this scripture, but did they take this spin on it? And they'll start talking about something. And pretty soon they'll start developing their own little ideas and doctrines. And they, they get the corner on the market on this. And uh, if you want to know it, come and buy my goods. That's exactly what, what happens sometimes with these know-it-all people. There's nothing wrong with knowledge, but you have to stay with the word. <laughs> you know, so, and that's what I'm trying to do here. I'm trying to just understand it. Um, like I said, with, with some sort of grounding. It says, repent or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against thee with the sword of my mouth. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh, I will give to eat of the hidden manna. I will give you to eat of the hidden manna. This is that food that we eat. Right? The, the manna, Jesus is that manna that we, we eat and live. But it says, I will give you, yeah, I will, of the hidden manna and will give him a white stone and in the stone a new name written which no man knoweth save he that receives it. So that's exactly what you would appeal. Said, so here's something, I have a secret. You want to know it? You know, do serve me, follow me. <laughs> do it my way. Don't you adopt false doctrines. You listen and you take up the you take up the word and what it says and I will give you a new name written on the stone that no man knoweth save he that hath received it. The 18th verse. Um, uh, and unto the angel of the church of Tyratira, right? Yeah. These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire and his feet like unto fine brass. I know thy works in charity, and service and faith and, and thy patience and thy works. It says works twice. And the last to be more than the first. <laughs> Again, he's talking about the works. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee because thou, hast, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed to idols. So it's the same sort of doctrine, but this time it's Jezebel, which was basically like a priestess of, the, of that doctrine, right? She was like the, she was a wicked, very viciously wicked uh, woman uh, to eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her a space to repent of her fornication and she repented not. God was patient with it. Behold, I will cast her into a bed and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with, with death. And all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts. And I will give unto every one of you according to your works. Again, works. But unto you, I say, and unto the rest of Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine and which have not known the death of Satan as they, as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden. So I'm not going to require anything more because it says, uh, which have not known the depths of Satan. I mean, they didn't follow after Satan. But, they, but that which ye have already hold fast till I come. So what you've already done, hold fast till I come. 
And he that overcometh and keepeth my words unto the end, to him I will give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a pot potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father. And I will give him the morning star. And he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Now this one right here, I guess a little bit longer stretch there than I read. But um, th that's uh, what you call a, p a power personality. I call it a power personality. Yes. It's someone who uh, desires after power uh, and authority, um, who likes authority, wants authority. Even if unconsciously, that's still what drives. Yeah, and that doesn't, you know, again, that doesn't mean they're vicious creatures. They just tend to, they tend to weasel their way to the top <laughs> sometimes. Now, bear in mind, Authority is good, especially when, they're, when it's competent authority and they, they are there to help. So there's people who have that drive and then turn around and do good with it. And then there are people who have that drive and turn around and just do evil. And then, yeah, Hitler, right? <laughs> and Mussolini and uh, Stalin and um, no, the right. other one. Yeah, a lot of them just... And there's a lot of people that do it on a minor scale, like in jobs, like they'll, they'll just work hard to get that position of power and then they have a reign of terror, <laughs> you know? But there's people like that. It, it is a, an honest drive, it's a, a nature. And um, you can do good or you can do, do evil with it. And that's what this thing is dealing with. It says, I know thy works in charity and service and faith and patience and thy works, it says it twice, the last to be more than the first. So it's all about their works. They, they're, they, they are doers. They get their authority. They go out there and they, they try to they get perform. They get things done. They may not have a brain cell left, but they're going to try to get it done. Right? I say that because sometimes it's, it's bad. Um, it's kind of like when you we talked about the knowledge based a bit while ago, just briefly. But they, they, they learn and they, they want knowledge. And sometimes they, they become where they just know things and they don't do anything. Well, the power base has the opposite problem. Sometimes they don't know what they're doing, but they're going to do it anyway. But they're going to take authority, right? They're just going to do it. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee because thou sufferest the woman Jezebel. Now, what I understand this is referring to, not just the doctrine here, but um, to me, that, that's the church. That's, that's the false church. That's, that's uh, people who, um, that's false religions in general. They'll, you know, it's like when somebody goes for authority. Never. Sometimes. Authority. Well, author, authority is enticing because as long as there's a place to, to get more authority, they tend to want to gravitate toward that. It's kind of like a, you know, it's like, well, that's a, 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 that's a domain I can dominate. Well, sometimes that can be used against you, and uh, it people have gotten themselves in bed with false religions unintentionally because they were just trying to trying to make um, be in charge of something. Well, yeah, it's kind of like if it, it's, it's let's say if there's an organization. I give you an example. It's hard to describe for some people. It's like say there's some sort of organization going on, like a council. And there's like all these different religions are sitting on the seat around that council. And they come up and, and they're all, they're, their authority is based upon who's serving them. And they're, they're like, if you have nobody following you, you're not in authority. You're just there. And so they want a council. They want an organization. So they come together and they all feel real special about each other in that organization. And then they turn around and say, well, there's a Jesus name church in the, in the community. And they say, well, we're lit. We, that guy right there, he's a pretty outstanding guy. We want him in our organization too. So they go approach the Jesus name pastor, say, why don't you join us? All you have to do is teach a little bit different and you can just be a part of all this. We'll all work together. We'll organize together. We'll do things together. And, um, Somebody who desires after authority and power more than they listen to God will jump right on board and they'll be a part of that council. And so you have these great organizations where people can 
can climb that hierarchy of power. You have the Catholic Church and all its domain, which is extensive. You have lesser churches and, and um, um, denominations like the Baptist and the Methodist and all these things where they just build the structure. You have Jehovah's Witness, they build their structures, right? And people try to climb those structures of power, but there's a compromise. You know, they're after more interested in climbing up power than they are in actually finding what God wants, where the power really exists. And so you have this, this issue here where, you know, here you are, it says, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, I mean, you're allowing this, you're suffering with, you're, you're allowing this, which calls herself a prophetess to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her a space to repentance, of, repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation. Those who join this this false church and false teachings and and this orga, these organizations, right? I will cast them. That, that's the bed that's laid, and that he cast them into that bed with her. And those that commit adultery with her, uh, he'll cause them to to fall into great tribulation except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searches the reins of the heart and hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. But unto you I say, and unto the rest of Thyatira, and as many as have not this doctrine, which have not known the depths of Satan, as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden. So those who didn't follow this doctrine this way, I'm not going to put in any more burden, but that yet that but that what you have already heard, uh, hold fast till I come. I want you to hold fast to what you already know. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him I give power over the nations. Because God has power over the, over the nations and he can give you power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. Because we're talking about power and ruling and those of authority. As the vessels of a potter shall, they be broken to shivers, even as I receive of my father. And I will give him the morning star. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the spirit saith unto the churches. You know, it's like one of the biggest problems these people do is just letting doctrine in for power's sake, uh, you know, just for gain's sake. So, jump to the next one. Uh, also, sometimes the word fornication is not just referring to sexual immorality. Sometimes it's referring to um, spiritual immorality where you're, where God is your husband and then you turn around and you go after another. And sometimes it refers to that unfaithfulness to God. Because here's what he wanted you to do, and this is what you're doing. The third chapter, first verse, and we're almost finished because we're getting to the cooler stuff. Those are harder, in-depth stuff. Yeah. They're all important. I know they're all important, but so, <laughs> some of what some is, of us find hard. The one on love is hands, beautiful, but. you know. Uh, see, um, and unto the angel of the church of Sardis, right? These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God. This is the seven churches, the seven spirits of God, and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest and art dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how that thou hast received and heard, and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which, I have, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me a while, or in, excuse me, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, 
and I will not blot his name out of my book of the of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. I grew up with a lot of these people right here. <laughs> this is honor based. Those who uh, desire honor more than anything. And they, they, uh, they understand respect. They, they're standard. They love standards. Very good people. Yeah, they're usually good people. They have a high set of standards and they try to keep those standards. But you see, God has a set of standards <clears throat> that you need to be keeping. And these are off, uh, and the God's standards will bring you honor. It will bring you honor even if you don't want honor. Honor's going to come. You keep God's standards. And uh, I know quite a number of people like this, especially in this area. It says, uh, I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest and art dead. Be watchful and strengthen, this is the second verse again, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. People of honor want to be perfect. Want to be perfect. They desire perfection. They want to meet the standard and always meet the standard. I mean, <laughs> you, you could almost say, well, the, the, an affliction would be like a, a perfectionist when someone's just way too out there. It's like they cannot ever make any mistakes, right? They got problems. So to say you're not perfect is like... Yeah, so they, they want to be perfect. They want honor. They want it legitimately most of the time. There are people who will come up with their own standards just to, you know, just to... Feel good. Feel good, you know. Say, so, well, I, I do this and I do that. I think there's a, there's some weird things like I think racism. Some of that falls under that a little bit because they say, well, I'm I'm a this color and therefore that makes me better than that person over there. And mm-hmm. some some kind of that doesn't mean in every case, mm-hmm. but um, there's some of that does happen. And so well, I I can do this. I can I can jump over. You know, uh, I'm an athlete, right? I can do these amazing things. Well, that makes me really important. And they'll sit there and they get their head stuck up in the air and they, 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 you know, they're real proud of themselves and, and they full of, you know, they, someone gives them a trophy or a, 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 a medal of honor and they're just, oh, it's so, so happy to receive. Oh, oh, don't do it. You know, they, they start acting real humble. Oh, don't do it. Oh, no, 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 no. And, um, well, you know. Coming up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it says, For I have not found thy works to be perfect before God. Remember, therefore, that thou hast received what thou hast received and heard. Remember what the standards are, right? God has the standards. And hold fast and repent. Hold fast to those standards and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. That's pretty straightforward. And thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which I which have not defiled. That means there are other people amongst you that didn't defile themselves. Look at them. There's your standard, right? It's like you can't keep what I'm trying to say. Well, look at there's other people doing that. It would make them jealous and say, Well, look at they can do it. What's wrong with you? Why can't you do it? Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white. That's your, there's your badge of honor. Mm-hmm. Their, per, their perfection. They shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. That's an honor terminology right there. They are worthy. They have met that standard. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. There is nothing more honorable than to have somebody brag on you. <laughs> I will confess his name. I will say, you know, let's see, look at, it. yeah, I will, I will say, uh, you know, I say, look at, um, look at Mary. Look, she, she did it. She obeyed me. She followed the commandment. Look at uh, Sister Nancy. She did exactly what she was supposed to. She walked worthy of the vocation wherewith she was called. You know, and you think about what that means. He's going to proclaim it. He's going to brag on you, right? And, and because he can and he wants to. 
because you did something worthy of this. You're walking worthy. So you receive the honor from walking worthy. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Next one, there's two left. Philadelphia. This is just a beautiful piece of work right here. But there's a warning in there. It says, and to the church, the seventh verse of the third chapter, three and seven, and to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, these things saith he that is holy and he that is true. He that hath the key of David, he that, op uh, he that openeth and no man shutteth and shutteth and no man openeth. That means what I say and what I do, it's going to be. And you ain't changing it and you ain't stopping it. What he opens, he opens. What he closes, he closes. And that's God. That's he's full of power. What he says is going to be. He says, I know thy works. Behold, I set before thee an open door. Remember who said it? God said it. And he says, I'll open, I set before thee an open door and no man can shut it for thou hast a little strength and hast kept my word and hast not defiled my name. Denied. Denied. Yeah, thou hast not denied my name. <clears throat> it's pretty close when your eyes are watering. <laughs> <laughs> Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will keep thee. I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon the, all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold fast which thou hast. This is that warning. Hold fast, which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Hold fast. I mean, don't be lazy about this. Hold fast, that no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out and I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. That personality is a pretty good one. That's love. Lo love. It's a love, love based personality. Now, there's good and bad about a love-based personality. Like we said, love is complete without. Love, love is, uh, it only, it, it, it sees the good and it cares about others and it's, it's focused on that positive deal. But the thing about it is love is t tends to be naive by nature because it doesn't see evil coming because it's not thinking about it. It has to learn to do that. Love has to learn I need to I need to look around the corner. I need to pay attention to evil. Because evil will destroy. To hate what is evil. To hate right. It, it has to learn how to hate evil because it it doesn't pay attention to that. It's thinking about the good things. It's thinking about walking up upright before God. It's thinking about all the joy it's going to bring people. It's thinking about it's naive. It's naive as all get <laughs> It just sees sunshine and daisies when this world isn't full of sunshine and daisies. And it gets itself hurt. So it has to learn some things. It has to learn how to behave. It has to learn how to, to, to keep itself uh, separated from this old world. But it says, but there's nothing evil in love. So it's sitting there saying, uh, you know, it says, I know thy works. I have set before thee an open door and that no man can shut. And thou hast, thou hast a little strength and has kept my word and has not denied my name. Love will never do that. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, it's talking about these enemies, which say that they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. <clears throat> it's not because 
you know, it's, it's not because uh, we're thinking, oh, it's going to worship to someone of love. I mean, it's love doesn't want to see people destroyed, but love wants to see people repent, right? I will make them come and worship before thy feet to, and to know that I, that I love thee because thou hast kept the word of my patience. I will keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly, hold fast which thou, uh, which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down from out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. It says to know that I love thee. So there's there's still a warning, but he's just not saying where the problems lie exactly. But it's fine in this case. Because, you know, the people who want to serve God, especially people who recognize that love, I mean, they keep digging, they keep searching. God talks to them, they hear it, but they just they just have to learn how to toughen up a bit. Um then the last one though now the last one's kind of you kind of have to know these people again <laughs> I don't understand because it sounds so scary when you read it but then if you know these people you understand why it sounds scary uh, Revelations 3 and 14 and unto the angel this is the last one and unto to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write these things saith the amen the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou art cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy. I counsel thee, right? I'm giving you some wisdom. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich in white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in unto him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne. Yeah, I'm gonna read that again. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. This last one, you wouldn't think this, uh, and I, I'm going to describe it uh, again. None of these, I guess, is real, real obvious. But these people I actually got to know. Um, if I wasn't around the, the craziest bunch of them, I wouldn't understand. Yeah, the theater. Uh, these are social people. And social people... They love interaction. They love people. They love being around people. They're very emotional, and they want to be emotional. They love emotion. In fact, you could say they love drama, and they love seeing drama. And if there's a fight over there where two people are pulling their hair out, they probably will start to gravitate over there <laughs> because that's drama. <laughs> They'll think that's drama, right? And they, they're, they're very dramatic in their behavior. And... And there's nothing wrong with being, see, social itself has a lot of wonderful things because uh, when two people are together, you know, it was a, a two strong or two strand cord or a three, yeah, three strand cord. Three strand cord can, well, there's fellowship. Yeah. There's, you know, yeah, there's a fellowship. You learn off when you have people around you, you learn off of them. Compassionate people. <sighs> well, I, again, I can say what I know. I learned a valuable lesson concerning people that sometimes you have to talk about what's on your mind in order to and have feedback from other people to realize just how stupid your thought was. 
<laughs> sometimes, sometimes if you're by yourself, you don't have any feedback and you think everything you say is generally okay. But sometimes it's not. And the only how you would know that is if somebody else said, hey, Aaron, that's a stupid idea. Maybe you shouldn't do this, right? Maybe you shouldn't skydive without a parachute. You know, I know you thought you could fly, Aaron, but you know, you know, and you've got, you kind of have, you need uh, feedback sometimes, right? And it's valuable because you just little things that you, you get yourself into and little ideas can have big consequences. That if you only had a friend to talk to and hopefully some wise friends to talk to, they would help you figure figure some things out. And I've gotten myself into horrible problems before simply because I didn't talk to anybody. I just didn't communicate what I was thinking about. And I didn't think that it was a big deal till one day I found out it was a big deal, Sister Martha. Uh, <laughs> so sometimes it's good to communicate and we need each other to str help strengthen one another to give us, because we all add something to the pot. It's like with all these people I've talked about, when we're all together, we all add something to each other. What the other one lacks and what the other one has a weakness, the other one, somebody else may have a strength and can fix that issue. If we're willing to listen to one another and tolerate one another and, and deal with one another through God because of love, we, can, we will become stronger, right? So there's, it's a good thing to be social sociable. However, when you take it too far and you love drama too much and you love those things, you, you can, you begin to perhaps be overwhelmed by emotions and you start living it, live in emotions, there could be a problem. Or you, you do what's popular just yeah. to have a social group. To yeah. Just to keep the social group. You, you, uh, well, well, everybody else says they want to crucify Christ. Well, might as well go along with the group. Crucify him, crucify him. They all hollered, right? They don't want to make anybody upset or mad. That's just, well, you know, the, the uh, seven hundred, they can't be wrong. And if I, if I don't agree with them, I'll be disowned by all these people. Well, let's just stay with the group and crucify this man. Yeah, he's probably innocent. And I heard all these rumors that he heals people. You know, but man, it can be horrible. What the results the flaws magnify. So I want to read this uh, again, and I want to emphasize what's going on here with this personality type. And then, then that's it for these people. Uh, it says, Unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would work. I, I would that thou were cold or hot. Since you neither, uh, so then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Cold and hot. You don't take a stand for anything. Right. Just go with the time. Yeah. And it's also, an, it's also an emotional way of saying something too. So you're either cold or you're hot. Right. And, and they're taking a lukewarm stance with God. Right, they may, yeah, they they may be heated when it comes to social groups. But are you going to st take a stand with God? Are you going to be on fire for God? You know, it says I would rather you to be cold or hot. It says, but because thou art lukewarm, that means you're just neither here nor there. You're just kind of just whatever. Well, I kind of like serving God, and neither cold nor hot. I will spew thee out of my mouth. That, my friend, is called drama on God's part. <laughs> yeah, well, it's rejection, but this is, I would call this drama. Because the words that he's fixing to say is the most dramatic way of saying it, that you can say it. It's incredibly dramatic. He says, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. You have need of nothing? And knowest that. Knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked? Boy, that's drama right there. I couldn't write anything better than that. If I was writing a play, that's that stuff right there you put on stage. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, 
and let the shame of thy nakedness do not appear and anoint thine eyes with eyes that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. He's just all over. He said he's not tolerating anything for these people. You either serve me with everything you got, with all your heart, soul, and mind, or you are you're going to be cast. You're going to be cast out. I'd rather you hate me and go run the opposite direction than to sit there and be lukewarm and on the fence. Be that middle ground. He does not tolerate that middle ground right there. He wants you to be passionate for the Lord. He wants you to give everything to God and just go go with it. It says. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear, hear my voice and open the door, I, this is social, right? I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. Fellowship. You want fellowship? fellowship? I will come right into you and we will just have a blast. I will sup with you. We will have dinner together, man. <laughs> we'll have drinks together. Just me and you. Just me and you, right? That's God saying that. Come on. You want some intimate relationship here? You want to be close? You want some friendship? I'll come right up into you, right up there. It says, to him that overcometh, will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and have sat down with my father in his throne. You will be right there with me. On and in his throne, you are going to be right there, not a mile and a half away, not at the base of the throne, but right there with the throne, with me. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Now that's, even if I'm wrong about these things, it's very interesting nonetheless. <laughs> All I know is that that. This is the kind of thing that God would do because he would write these messages and he would talk to his people in this way. There's other you know, messages even the, yeah. for these seven types. Yeah, the there's other uh, examples of this actually too. The whole Sermon on the Mount that I went over before is, is broken up into this kind of thing. But it, with the Sermon on the Mount, he had an agenda. This one right here, he had a little message for everybody, you know. He, he took the strengths and weaknesses and put them together in the, in the Sermon on the Mount. Here, he just like, he's stopping and restarting, stopping, restarting, stopping, restarting, talking to that person, that person, that person, that person, in the same pattern. He has a pattern. Like he'll, he'll start with stuff like, um, these things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his hands. These things saith, see, um, these things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. Uh, these things saith he that hath the sharp sword with two edges. He starts with the same pattern and ends with the same pattern. Says to him that overcometh, I will eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. To him that overcometh, I will give to eat of the hidden manna and will give him a white stone and in the in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, save he that receiveth it. And he that overcometh and keepeth my words unto the end, to him I will give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter, they shall be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father, and I will give him the morning star. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will blot out his name out of the book and I will not blot his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. And it continues on. It's like this pattern. He's saying something specific, but in the same pattern every single time. Right? The little messages just to you. Um, and it, it, to me, that's like every time I see people try to reimagine these things, the, the, these sets of scriptures, I'm like, well, that, I don't know. There's just so much. There, there has to be a reason why he's saying these things. And I just don't know that reason. And they'll try to put it in history. And they'll try to devise a pattern how it fits into history. And you're like, huh? <laughs> but I, anyway, so I may be wrong. But I sure enjoy this. And most of the stuff with Revelations, I know that, that um, if it's something I need to know, I will know it. I mean, in the rest of the scriptures too, but something I need to know, God's going to teach it mm -hmm. to me. 
some of these things it's like, well, I don't know if I need to know it, but I find it's pretty cool. But I wonder sometimes, do I need to know this, you know, and why? But God's a good God. Anyway, so I'm just going to just thank God for the, <laughs> for the deal. Anyway, uh, thank you, Jesus, for your goodness and mercy. Thank you, dear God, that the thought was clear. Dear God, as best as I understood, we know that you're above everything. We know that you understand everything. And if we lack any understanding, we know that you can give it. We appreciate you and love you for your goodness and your mercy. We know that you have our interests at heart. And we love you, appreciate you, and thank you for everything you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.